All right, we're live. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hope everybody's doing well today. Uh, got a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. <laughs> First and foremost, um, uh, new Christmas Avi. Gotta, gotta shout that out because originally it was supposed to be a uh, Twitter Avi, but as those of you who may or may not know, um, my Twitter account was showed for calling out pedos, but such is life. And, um, but for those of you who may be wondering, uh, the winter Christmasified Avi I have is just, uh, was done by Owen Cyclops. For those of you who couldn't tell, this is kind of his style. So people who know of him, uh, will recognize it. People who don't go follow him on Twitter at Western identity. Uh, you know what, uh, when I'm going over this video when i'm going back over it i'll probably uh i'll probably credit him for the new avi in the description i don't right now because i didn't think of it because i didn't think of changing my avi until a couple minutes before the stream but anyway that's that but uh on the topic of my twitter for again for people who may not know i got the ban hammer brought down on me Again, for calling out Pedo, so it's not like I regret anything I said. But uh, just an announcement. Maybe I'll clip it out into something else. But I am not going to be coming back to Twitter, most likely. Uh, it is my probably most effective means of outreach. And so it's kind of a bummer to have it gone. But at the same time, it's just... It's a time waster. It's a drain. Um, you know... And it's just full of negative energy, man. Like, as much as it's fun interacting with the leftoids or interacting with those on the ultra-right who just don't, you know, get it, it's really just a huge drain on not only my mental energy, but my spiritual energy as well. And, you know, Owen's art can only give me so much energy. Uh, but, you know, uh, again, such is life. I did want to give a shout out to Owen for like the work he's done so far, though, because uh, it's good stuff, and I'd feel uh, remiss if I didn't use it in some function or capacity. And so here it is. Here is my uh, Christmasified Owen Cyclops uh, YouTube Abby, as it as it is. But yeah, that's only. Uh, that's only some little intro stuff out of the way. With that out of the way, we can get into the uh, meat and potatoes of this stream, which is Slavoj Žižek, my boy, sort of, not entirely, but I'll get into that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Slavoj Žižek is a Slovenian Marxist Hegelian, left Hegelian philosopher, I feel like is a better descriptor. But yeah, he's a big deal amongst the contemporary left. And so, you know, he's uh, been known for his talks. He's spoken at Occupy Wall Street when it was still a thing. Uh, he goes around the world pretty much lecturing. That's pretty much how he makes money. Uh, that and like the millions of, not millions, but dozens of books he's written um, over the course of something like 20, maybe 30, going on 30 years now. But he's written something like 60 maybe more books not all of them translated into english mind you but he has an uh, unprecedented output really and so that's one of the reasons he's better known but even though he's a marxist he still has in my mind a lot of valuable contributions to offer to philosophy uh not the least of which being his cultural critiques which often oddly enough very similarly end up aligning with uh, sentiments on those from the reactionary right a lot of the time. You can actually see this if you talk to somebody like uh, Rodin on Twitter, DSA Rodin, who's a pretty funny guy. Uh, he talks a lot about how critical theory and guys like uh, Horkheimer and Adorno, famously known for writing the dialectic of enlightenment or, you know, the sort of quote unquote Frankfurt School cultural Marxist Bible in layman's terms often have critiques of modern culture that many on the reactionary right would not disagree with at all. Uh, Dr. Lehman also did a 
video briefly discussing this. Well, he didn't discuss that specifically. He was bashing Paul Joseph Watson and he used a Horkheimer quote. Uh, Horkheimer? It might have been an Adorno quote. It was, I think, it, I think it was taken from the dialectic of enlightenment, but to the effect that, you know, culture is fraudulent. Um, it's being mass produced by the media. It's no longer authentic like it used to be. And that's only one of his critiques. Another of his Slavoj Žižek's ideas in particular is the idea of authentic spirituality and trying to uh, rediscover what that is. Now, he has an idea, obviously, differing from those on the right on what constitutes true spirituality. But it's still a worthy critique that I think we can kind of co-opt to some extent. Uh, if not co-opt, certainly appreciate for uh, the th certainly appreciate it for what it has to offer. Uh, again, just because you don't agree with someone's methodology, but you happen to agree with their uh, conclusion, doesn't mean there's nothing to be gained from it except the conclusion. So there is certainly room for uh, taking what you can. Now, um, I'm specifically going to be reading from a couple of not books of his. They're kind of a synopsis of all his books and all his thoughts. Um, it's the, but it's if all from the text I'll be quoting is from the Introducing Slavoj Žižek, a graphic guide book, which you can pick up in Barnes and Noble for like four bucks, eight bucks. I forget how much I got this for, uh, but it's pretty cheap. Um, uh, it wasn't four bucks. I shouldn't say that. Nothing in Barnes and Noble is four bucks, except some of the cheap gifts uh, you can occasionally gift. But uh, yeah, order it from Amazon. It's not expensive, and it's a good introduction to the whole of Slavoj Žižek's thoughts, in my opinion. As, as well as that, if you want another good introduction into Žižek, I'd recommend um, his joke book, Žižek's jokes. Did you hear the one about Hegel and negation, which is? Uh, <laughs> I, th I think the title's funny in itself, but that's, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's just me. Also, um, something else I'll probably link in the video description that I have now. I've got to link a lot. I'll link uh, Owen's Twitter in uh, there to thank him for the artwork. Um, and if somebody could get that, my appreciation out to him, I can't directly contact him through the Twitter sphere anymore. But if somebody wants to get my thanks out to him, I would be greatly appreciative. Um, but on top of that, if you, I'll also link a playlist I have, an unlisted playlist that I might make public now that, uh, whatchamacallit, I'm not tweeting something out every time I add a video to it because my Twitter's down. So um, it's, I have it titled The Zizek Talks. It's also in my Discord if you'd like to join that. I posted it there. But it's just a series of clips uh, from lectures and uh, lecture, a uh, whole lectures in some cases by Zizek. And so a lot of them I find are very insightful. Uh, they're very good at getting to understand him. So a lot of the stuff I've listened to a good amount of his lectures at this point. And so when, uh, whatchamacallit, when I go back over like the, uh, introduction in, in his book, a lot of it's like retreading the same ground for me that I've already listened to. And you know, it's just, it's just background noise. You turn it on when you're in the car, things like that. But uh, it's interesting stuff all the same. And I think he has a lot of useful insights. Now, some of what I'm going to be, uh, the title of this video is not intended to be clickbaity. It will be kind of going over or at least touching on all of the subjects I mentioned, um, particularly by reading, how many pages or so is this? Like roughly twenty pages, but if you if you read the book, most of these um, pages are pictures, and really there's only like four or five paragraphs of text at most on a single page, and so you could sit down and read this book within the course of uh, five hours. Not even I'm I'm a slow reader, so for me it takes like three because I sit down and I reread things, even things I've heard, because to hear them explained in a different way is often uh, it often sheds some light on stuff. But the good, attentive reader who doesn't need to go back over stuff can probably get this done in an hour, not even 45 minutes. But yeah, uh, let's get into it. And obviously, I'll stop and 
uh, add commentary where I think necessary. But this is a good book. It's ordered so that most of the topics sort of flow into each other as you go from page to page, because essentially each page or three is another topic that would be considered important to Zizek or would be in, considered important for the reader to know about Zizek. And so it's very usefully organized. And so it makes it hard to find an exact cutoff, an exact point to stop at. But uh, I'll be reading for a bit and adding the commentary wherever. So the first part is on page 57, and it's labeled ideology and repression. And if you know Slavoj Žižek, his big thing is uh, e ideology, not just the uh, ideology in terms of like, you know, are you liberal, fascist, communist, uh, absolutist, things like that, but um, the ideology of society and not just the rules of, you know, human social interaction, but the rules which govern the rules of human social interaction, the meta rules, if you will, and sort of, um, you know what, I actually have, uh, I think there's a good Horkheimer quote to this effect. Uh, Zizek is himself somewhat of a critical theorist. And so he does take a good bit from Adorno and Horkheimer and other critical uh, theorists. In particular, um, he talks about Habermas a lot. I can't speak to, uh, on, to any authority on what Habermas has offered. Every time I've looked over the titles of his books or synopses, they've seemed somewhat irrelevant to me. But um, yes, okay, here it is. But he references him a lot, usually in disagreement, but always paying some respects to him. But Zizek himself is a critical theorist, and he sort of operates within this definition to some extent of ideology. And this is a quote from Harkheimer's essay, uh, which essay? Um, Notes on Science and the Crisis. Okay. Um, so as Horkheimer says, quote, every human way of acting which hides the true nature of society built as it is on contrarieties is ideological and the claim that philosophical, moral, and religious acts of faith scientific theories, legal maxims, and cultural institutions have this function is not an attack on the character of those who originate them, but only states the objective role such realities play in society. And so this is sort of the definition of ideology Zizek is, offer, uh, is operating on to a large extent. It's this idea that truth is being obfuscated by human social interaction and usually language in particular, because while Zizek believes language contains some elements of truth, he believes that's only glancing truths. And so you never get to the whole thing. Um, a good little addendum, which uh, picks up right after that quote by Horkheimer is, views valid in themselves and theoretical and aesthetic works of undeniably high quality can in certain circumstances operate ideologically, while many illusions on the contrary are not a form of ideology. And so, uh, I think this also is a useful addendum when going over Zizek because it speaks to the fact that because things contain truth, they're easier to then bend into bigger lies. Whereas things that are just outright sort of, not necessarily falsehoods, but things that aren't to be taken seriously by their nature won't be used ideologically because they're not useful. So something has to have a grain of truth in order for it to be used ideologically. Otherwise, otherwise people won't buy into it. And so with that in mind, we can jump it back into uh, introducing Slavoj Žižek. So this is page 57, and this is the heading, Ideology and Repression. Like other radical thinkers, Žižek's opposition towards capitalism lies in its creation of social inequalities, particularly as this is manifested in terms of the distribution of wealth. But he does not believe that political opposition to capitalism can arise solely through an understanding of economics. For him, political and social repression, however manifested, is ultimately caused by ideology, operating off of that similar definition I just gave by Horkheimer. And also, um, if you pick up the book and go through it, you'll notice, as I said, most of the pages are pictures. Some of the pages have uh, Zizek and other figures talking in, um, thought bubbles, or not necessarily thought bubbles, but word bubbles too. And so I'll try to differentiate between what's uh, what's another character talking and what's like the text of the book talking. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt a Zizek impression here, so bear with me. Uh, Jeffrey, 
my principal task is as a philosopher is to analyze analyze ideology, particularly as this is bound up with the formation of the individual social identity through language and uh, discourse that is the symbolic order. And we we'll get into the symbolic order right now. What is the symbolic order? The symbolic order is both any system of communication, such as language, discourse, a method of monetary exchange, a game, or any system of signs, and the rules governing that system. Zizek refers to the game of chess to illustrate how rules operate in symbolic systems. Each chess piece, for instance, the knight or the castle, can move only in certain ways. The same idea applies to language. Uh, this is a quote from Zizek, but not in a word bubble. These are grammatical rules, which I have to follow almost blindly and spontaneously, and of which I am hardly conscious. If I were to bear these rules in mind all the time, my speech would break down. And that's some of the inner contradiction he would point out between our colloquial language and how we sort of casually break certain rules of language as we speak versus uh, what the formal rules say we ought to or how the rules say, formal rules say we ought to speak. Uh, so continually. Similar, similarly, there are rules governing social interaction, affecting politeness, friendliness, and social space that in our everyday lives are not normally consciously noticed or considered. There's also a whole set of taboos and prohibitions about what and when not to say or do something. For Zizek, submitting to the rules that govern language and forms of social interaction is not a natural process. The entry into the symbolic order is not natural or inherent within the human gene code. There is no inborn language instinct with, within man. And I'm fading in and out between Slovenian and Austrian, but it's hard because he talks with a lisp. Um, but yeah, there's this. I, this is one of the first points I'll have of disagreement with him being that, well, there is obviously no language gene per se obviously you are taught language uh whatever language that is from birth it isn't also right to say that we didn't develop language for a reason i mean i think you could point to the fact that multiple species have their own forms of communication which we could call language and we could say that animals have a symbolic order of their own most notably our closest genetic relatives being like the bonobos and the chimpanzees, of course, and their system of hierarchy, whatever it may be. But it's really not fair to, I don't believe to say, or accurate, more fa fairness be damned. It's not accurate to say that language is something unnatural that we enter into simply because it's not within our gene code. Rather, it's something we chose to build and something we choose to maintain because of the pragmatic benefits of it, which I think is something Something else, the sort of uh, the uh, what call it? The uh, Frankfurt School folks try to argue against. They try to argue against a liberal or positive, liberal positivistic or pragmatic outlook. And so that might be what some of this is coming from. But at the same time, there can be pragmatism beyond simple use within the liberal symbolic order. So perhaps too narrow to simply dismiss it. Uh, continuing, the Trojan horse. Zizek believes that the symbolic order is a gift of communication for humanity, but it also, but it is also a, as dangerous to humanity as the horse was to the Trojans. It offers itself to our use free of charge, but once we accept it, it colonizes us. In using language which we do all the time to communicate and think, we are essentially unconscious beings. While we may be familiar with the grammatical and social rules governing language and communication, we cannot be conscious of all them in the act of participating in communication. And this is an almost uh, Kaczynskiite point I think Zizek is making, whereas Kaczynski would say, as we have developed technology, we have become slaves to it and now exist to further advance it. Zizek is applying sort of that same logic to language itself, which is an interesting take all the same. But of course, in the same way in which we control machines, we also control language. Language is, of course, a fluid thing in the same way technology is. It's ever changing and ever advancing and regressing, possibly in some instances. So as much as it obviously influences us as 
all cultural advancements have influenced humans, there isn't really a, it's not a one, it's not a one way street or as one way as perhaps uh, Zizek might make it out to be. Uh, a good example of this is when we talk about the evolution of the tool. And one of the books I'd read some time ago was called uh, Robert Ardrey's The Hunting Hypothesis. And it talks about humans coevolution with other animals after the sort of uh, the great Saharan drought had sort of killed all the trees in the great forest in Africa. And we now had to deal with the plains. What was necessary for us to do was to create tools in order to survive, like spears and simple clubs and things like that, so we could kill other animals, not, e not only for self-defense, but also because without trees, we didn't have access to fruits to scavenge, and so we needed a new source, which would, uh, would inevitably become hunting. And so in order to use the tool, which we kind of knew was out there, this not simply the form of the tool, but the actual spear itself, you know, a sharp stick, a sharp rock a sharp rock tied to a stick, something like that, we needed to evolve to better use it. And so we needed to evolve to walk upright. We needed to evolve thumbs to grip it better. And at the same time, we needed to lose the, uh, uh, the opposable thumbs on our feet because it was no longer necessary for us to climb trees as they just weren't there anymore. And we became an upright walking species. And so really kind of somewhat counterintuitively to what we are taught commonly, we, it was the tool that forced our evolution as opposed to the human evolving and then learning to use the tool. It was the fact that this tool existed and we needed it, which forced us to evolve. So some, somewhat talking into somewhat uh, an anthropological perspective on Zizek's point itself, as all tools have forced us to evolve and adapt to them, of course, whether this not that makes them bad or good is yet to be decided. Depends on how it's used, obviously. And at the end of the day, we still control our tools. We still choose to use them. And we choose to use them, again, I'd say, on pragmatic basis. And without those, if they were no longer pragmatic, presumably we'd stop using them. But of course, perhaps we wouldn't for ideological reasons. Uh, to continue, meaning and the symbolic order. Underlying all of the rules that govern the usage of any symbolic system is one fundamental rule or law. Meaning is dependent upon the symbolic system itself. And the paradox is that even if this dependency is recognized, it can only be done within the terms of the symbolic order. Uh, speaking to how if you oppose an ideology, say within the United States, um, you're really only doing so within the framework of the dominant ideology. Say if you oppose the Republicans or the Democrats or the mainstream party and you try to start your own party, you're still doing so in the context of the liberal democratic framework. And so you're only further validating the system by rebelling against it within the framework of that same system because there's no other option in a lot of cases. Uh, to continue, however much however much we may strive to be conscious of our dependency and however much we may desire to represent our submission to the symbolic order, we cannot step out of it. The symbolic, uh, this is, I think this is Lacan talking. I don't know what Lacan sounds like, so just know these next few blips are in word bubbles. The symbolic order governs not just what we say, but what we think. Individual subjects exist in and for language and the symbolic order, but not otherwise. And again, this is sort of a, this gets a little bit into uh, Zizek's subject-oriented ontology in which we as the subjects of language, not just simply as users, but as the ones engaging in building an ontological framework around the symbolic order are simultaneously the centers while simultaneously being nothing at the same time. You know, what we do to sort of try to uphold the symbolic order and Tzizek is just a mask and we're truly nothing inside, but we'll get into that in just a bit. Uh, speaking of the big other, I knew we would get to that. Uh, for Zizek, the constraint whereby the symbolic order governs the formulation of the subject's own self-identity depends upon the rule of an authoritarian superego. Just as the rules and laws governing the symbolic order are always present, it cannot be acknowledged, so too, 
This applies to the superego as an embodiment of these rules and laws. I call this unconscious figure the superego of the superego, the big other. And so, yeah, the superego is a psychoanalytic term first coined by F Freud. And it's obvious, and it's, for those of you who don't know, it's this idea that it's our, uh, it's the part of our conscious which determines what is right and wrong and the, and commands us to act thusly. Uh, uh, what is this here? We got a comment from Dusty. What's up, Dusty? This holistic account of meaning sounds profoundly Kantian where the symbolic order one participates supplants the categories. Yeah, it's heavily Kantian and in no small part being in part because Zizek is heavily... Well, one, he's a Galian, and of course, you can't deny Kant's influence on Hegel. On the other part, uh, Zizek just has an appreciation for Kant on his own. So yes, it is very Kantian. And perhaps the way Zizek would put it is, the paradox is that that which exists uh, creates meaning for itself, in that you, c you can't have identity without the thing existing w within the first place. And so you know, you don't have the person who got in the car accident without the car accident. And so you don't have this person as he is without the car accident. And so that action, that identity couldn't exist without, or that person couldn't exist without that accident by which it defines him, sort of. It's a very I don't fully understand it myself because I haven't read Hegel's logic, which I think is what it mostly borrows from. But it does sort of speak to that same uh, drive of the symbolic order supplanting the categories themselves. But to continue, am I saying that too much? Perhaps. But anyway. <laughs> Therefore, the symbolic order is composed of two elements acting in tandem. On the one hand, a subject who is formed through participating in the symbolic order, and on the other hand, an imaginary big other that perpetually holds out the illusion that the symbolic order is a medium for achieving unitary meaning and reciprocity with other subjects. And so I'm sure Kurt Doolittle would have a fit about this, but because he's big into this sort of dissection of language and its use for conveyance of meaning. But, uh, so essentially, as Dusty sort of said, the symbolic order supplants the categories in sense. It exists, and so it creates the events by which it perpetuates itself. It's essentially a feedback loop of sorts, um, an infinite regression, essentially, which is, uh, of course, you know, Something you can talk about when you talk about the creation of the universe. There's some ideas that the universe was never, uh, didn't exist, that it's just been going back and forth in cycles and things like that. Or that you can infinitely refer back to the same thing over and over again. And this is a sort of, uh, it's, I'm hesitant to say it's a metaphysical claim, but it's pretty, it, it sort of is at the same time. Because me, the definition of meaning here is wholly dependent on this idea that meaning is something we create by participating in the system and the system is what and is there and there is no meaning without the system and so at the same time the, the system is a parasite it gets very very tricky and of course another disagreement here profoundly um, in the metaphysical sense meaning is obviously transcendent it goes beyond simply our use of words and what they're meant to portray and our ability to convey language and meaning and things like that and meaning through language. But I'll continue on here. A measure of the difficulty, even impossibility of breaking free from the illusion of achieving reciprocity through language is the case of James Joyce's modernist book, Finnegan's Wake. Joyce's text engages in a plurality of meanings and a multitude of historical and fictional references that seem to defy any rule of law. Nevertheless, the book is treated as if it is coherent, if only in terms of being a reflexive book concerned with language and meaning. And so even something meant to be rather absurdist is then bent to the 
uh, directives of the system to convey something the system wants. Uh, the Emperor's New Clothes. Zizek emphasizes the fact that the Big Other is just as much a fiction as the symbolic order. We, uh, quoting, Zizek, quoting Zizek, we all know that the Emperor is naked in reality, but nonetheless, we agree to the deception that he is wearing new clothes by submitting to the symbolic order. While talking, I am ne merely an individual interacting with other individuals. The Big Other is always president. But effectively, the Big Other is properly virtual. It exists only insofar as subjects act as if it exists. And so, I need to sniffle more. That would be closer to Zizek. But, so essentially, we all whether explicitly or tacitly agree that language conveys meaning or we uh, tacitly or implicitly agree that there are these rules that we need to obey to govern behavior and things like that. Uh, and you know, something that we agree exists does in effect make it exist to some extent, but in a realer, more metaphysical sense, it doesn't unless it is actually real. So, you know, everybody saying that the earth is flat and science saying it's flat, so forth and so on, effectively makes it flat. But of course, in a broader, realer sense, it doesn't. But it does, is truth only language? Yes, essentially, according to Zizek. But again, I would disagree with him strongly on there. Uh, quoting Zizek again. Its substance is actual only in so far as individuals believe in it and act accordingly. Therefore, the big other is also based upon lack. Like the subject, it exists only in merely an effect of the symbolic system. So essentially, it doesn't exist. We all agree it exists for now. Subjectivity is founded upon what Lacan termed a lack, the lack that is our unconscious. The unconscious exists as a blind spot in subjectivity, our inability to articulate and be fully conscious of our dependency upon the symbolic order. Thus, there is a void or nothingness at the center of our being that effectively means our subjectivity is a void, a fiction. And of course, this is big with uh, not only Zizek, but a lot of Hegelians who buy into uh, radical human subjectivity, as in we are beings which essentially don't exist in any sort of substantial sense, uh, owing in large part to Hegel's idealism. Rather, we are simply parts of a whole acting out a material illusion, really. And so there's actually, this also gets into the idea of a recurring joke by Zizek of the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. Which uh, is which he and then of course the uh, unknown knowns, which is his sort of contribution to it. But really, um, it's not specifically his. I'm trying to think of when I was in high school. We took uh, there's this understanding of how we're arranged as people. There's and it sort of goes back to that meme about the three faces you show people around you. There's you know two sides to people really though there's like the public face they have and then there's their inner face and basically there's ways of viewing it from either perspective there's the side of you that you know about and others know about and there's the side of you that only you know about and others don't know about then there's the side of you that you know and others know as i said and then there's the side of you that only your friends really know because only can they can provide that outside perspective but then behind all that, there's the side of you that neither your friends know and neither you know. And I can't think of the name of this type of personality analysis. It's something window, not uh, not the Overton window. It's, I can't, I can't think of the name of it. I'd have to go over notes from 11th grade, but, and this is essentially what uh, Zizek is appealing to here. The fact that we are really what neither we know nor what others know about us. And essentially, being nothing, everything is an act. We are nothingness with a mask, essentially. 
But of course, if we're all nothingness, that means, well, there's a lot of moral implications from that, honestly. If we're all nothingness and we're simply acting out radical subjectivity, there's nothing particularly morally binding us and there's no reason to be morally concerned about anything in particular. But in my mind, this is uh, Zizek making another ontological uh, miscarriage here. Whereas, you know, if we're all equally nothingness and that's at the center of our being, but there's this mask that's really doing all the acting. It's the thing that we see. It's the thing that our friends see. And our friends may see it from one way. We may see it from one way. Sometimes those view over uh, converge. Then really, that's what, you know, we are. That's the majority of our being. If the thing that's acting out in daily life is what everybody knows, like effectively, that should be the center of our being. That should be the ontological subject cent- subject centered universe of Zizek. Because if it's all this nothingness, then there's nothing to talk about, right? There's no need to have us in the central framework of any greater moral schema. It's just, it's nothing. We don't need to be concerned with it. But but if we are the mask, if we are that thing that covers this nothingness, that makes it a much more important to focus on. Because then how we act, how we conduct ourselves becomes relevant in that we're all building off each other in terms of how we play off each other's acts and how we build on the criticisms of our friends and how we build on how we view ourselves, essentially. How we build on, you know, the known unknowns and the known knowns to some extent. And of course, again, this would carry much more moral weight to have this as an ontological center than to have nothingness as an ontological center. But again, I think this is one of Zizek's mistakes. Um, also, what was I going to say? I'm trying, yeah, you know, never mind. We'll, we'll continue on and it'll come back to me. Uh, Zizek. It is as if we subjects of language talk and interact like puppets our speech and gestures dictated by some nameless, all-pervasive agency. And the, uh, quoting Zizek, the symbolic order, society's unwritten constitution, is the second nature of every speaking being. It is here directing and controlling my acts. It is the sea I swim in, yet it remains ultimately impenetrable. I can never put it in front of me and grasp it. So, again, this is sort of while it is simultaneously the superego, it is a rather um, idealist point of someone who is ostensibly a materialist. You know, if we all agree this thing exists and it is effectively, you know, forcing us to act in certain behaviors, it, it is real and it is something that's moving us in a certain direction one way or the other. Hegel would have called this the absolute. And if the big other is the absolute, it's all pushing us towards itself. And If we go with Hegel's or Zizek's idea of that, it's really that um, the absolute is pushing us towards nothingness because nothingness is the last absolute. Now, there's something to be said here in how Zizek uses Sartre and contrasts being with nothingness and how that plays into his view of the dialectic process. But that's something this book doesn't even cover. And so I won't because that's Getting into Hegel's logic is a bit much. And so now we get into some of Zizek's more Marxist overtones. Uh, On page 66, the heading, A Universal System of Exchange. In Zizek's view, the political economist Karl Marx's analysis of the capitalist economic system in his book, Capital, anticipated his own ideas about the symbolic order. Marx pointed out that all economic systems, including capitalism, rely upon a single universal medium. In capitalist case, this is money, by which to gauge and evaluate all that can be exchanged and sold. And this is Marx's little bubble. Uh, the, uh, I can't do a good German accent off the top of my head. Uh, the value of a commodity assumes the form of another thing, money. And it's interesting because I've been trying to read a little bit of Das Kapital. It's impossible to get through. It's worse than Hegel by miles. And he talks about different things, referencing different values. And he tries to make a lot of Hegelian points about it, how, you know, there is no category of man without men, you know, 
if you're just one thing that exists on some lonely little speck in the universe, you're not a category. You're truly an individual. Like if Robinson Crusoe were the only human being on earth, he wouldn't be a man. He would be an anomaly on the face of the earth. There would be no category to call, call him because there's not anything else like him to compare himself to until you get other men who come to rescue him. And then he's no longer this individual. He is a man amongst many men. And so you have the category of men emerge from the fact that there can must be more than one. And this plays into Hegel's idea of uh, the fact that an individual datum point is really not concrete. It is abstract in that it tells you nothing unless you can relate it to something greater, a universal, which is what Hegel would call concrete. Now, what Marx tries to do in his first few sections in Capital is relate a couple different forms of value, um, being one being exchange value, use value, and then a sort of value proper. But he's trying to relay these universals in a series of different ways in which they, it doesn't actually work because, whatchamacallit, Hegel says that categories are formed from universals of like things. But these different values, Marx is simultaneously trying to make out as distinct and one and the same, which would be an interesting, I suppose, move of the dialectic if you wanted to frame like it, frame it like that, but he doesn't. He's claiming these categories are simultaneously different and the same, like the exchange value and the use value are all reflections of the true value, but that doesn't work. The individual Robinson Crusoe on the island is a reflection of man as a category because he is like other men. These are different values, all of which are dependent on other things. Like Marx wholly acknowledges the subjective uh, factor of exchange value, then it can't reflect any underlying objective value within the object itself. So it's a very uh, contradictory point from Marx there, in my opinion. But uh, to continue, the use of a single medium of exchange, money, subordinates every product, commodity, and thing into one universal trading system. While this enables calculative exchanges to occur, it also represses the possibility of categorical differences between products, commodities, or things. Marx's point was to question the viability of being able to comparatively evaluate products, commodities, including the amount of labor and time spent on making something and things. And this is another speech bubble by Marx. Indeed, there may be forms of production or modes of labor and being in this world that cannot be given monetary value, which is true enough. The most, well, it's true and it's not true in the sense that everything can be given a monetary value in the sense that we can kill anything, depending on how you want to stretch the definition of kill, or you can paint anything blue. Like that's something you reasonably could do. It'd be hard, but you potentially could. And then what you have after that is that the question really isn't, can you put everything in monetary value? Yes, you can. The question is, should you really? It's more of a normative question than it is one of uh, objective metaphysical value. And so, again, this is sort of Marx conflating things. The subjectivity of the normative question of should things be have a normative, va uh, a monetary value versus the idea that this is repressing objective value or that it interferes with objective value or that there really is no monetary value at all. And so, again, it's conflicting categories where really there shouldn't be a conflict. Well, this is a long section. I haven't had heading in a while. Marx believed that both traders and consumers under capitalism offer, often recognize the absurdity of tying every product, commodity, and thing into one universal system of exchange governed by the index of money, which is, again, a fair enough point and a fairly reactionary point that I imagine many on the right would agree with. You know, it's stupid to try and, you know, pay mothers for their service as, as mothers because the task is so incalculably valuable that to put a monetary value on it would demean the labor that goes into raising a child itself. It's something so beyond money that it, there shouldn't be a price put on it. Again, not that there couldn't be, though. 
I suppose. Uh, but it goes on. This absurdity is highlighted by the difficulty of how to adequately determine wages to workers and producers where questions of amounts of time, care, intellect, and mental and physical power exercised in the activity of work have to be taken into account and given a comparative price. Oh yeah, that's the other thing Marx, the other category Marx says supposedly reflects objective value, which would be labor value. But again, so you have use value, exchange value, labor value, and then all of these sort of reflect the objective value, although all of them, labor value Marx acknowledges as especially uh, con uh, time contextually dependent because obviously labor value changes with the amount of labor you put into something and the amount of effort, you know, the average amount of effort the society puts in. For example, you know, I could put in five hours weaving a nice sweater, whereas some factory in Hong Kong could knit that same sweater in like, or not Hong Kong, maybe Vietnam could knit that sweater in like an hour. And because, you know, we exist in a global society and the average total work hours put into a single sweater is one hour, that's all I'd be able to charge it according to Marx. So there's all these very subjective factors that go into value that supposedly f reflect objective value. But again, that's not how the Hegelian system of universals works. So Marx is trying to conflate categories that are that he's claiming are separate but are also claiming are the same without justification to do so uh, when individuals use money they know very well that it is not a magical formula by which to calculate exchange uh, and this is zizek individuals know very well that being the relation that behind the relations things bleh. All right, I'm going to give up on the Zizek accent. Uh, individuals know very well that behind the relations between things, there are incalculable relations between people. And of course, this is actually uh, a Marxist point acknowledged by the Austro-Libertarian school, who also agree in the radical subjectivity of value, funnily enough. Uh, which is a point you shouldn't tell uh, Austro-Libertarians how much Marx actually agrees with them, but comes to wildly different conclusions. It's essentially, if you want to get down to it metaphysically, the same system, but um, they draw rap uh, rapidly different uh, normative conclusions. And so, because eventually, because they're all essentially operating on the same materialist metaphysic, like, I think Mises was supposedly a Catholic, but there is not a trace of Catholic metaphysical underpinnings within anything he's ever written, be it, um, uh, what's it, Human Action, or any of his other essays or major works and things like that. So it's very clearly a materialist set ideology. And if you ask me, um, who draws the right conclusions from that same metaphysical ontological framework of like, you know, the individual and non-contradiction and things like that, I'd actually have to give it to the Marxists. But not because they're right, but because they're both wrong. But the Marxists are wrong in the right ways, whereas the Austrians are just all wrong. Um, but to continue, they do not know it. Nevertheless, while individuals may recognize the limits within the capitalist system of exchange and the inherent difficulties of calculating exchanges between products, commodities, and things, this recognition becomes futile in the act of monetary exchange to which every manufacturer and consumer has to submit. And so, again, this is the, the more you rebel within the system, uh, the more you're just validating that system, and the harder it is to step outside the system. So, you know, people who actively step outside the liberal capitalist framework of being uh, that sort of symbolic order would be people who, you know, Perhaps some communes might be considered to have stepped out of this. Um, Ted Kaczynski, for the most part, did a great job of stepping out of the liberal capitalist order, funnily enough, as an Ann Prim, because he rejected technology and he rejected, well, he implicitly rejected prop profits in the capitalist system. I haven't read his essay yet, although I've been meaning to, but I haven't, haven't been willing to purchase it from Amazon and end up on the no-fly list yet. Uh, but to continue, uh, this is Marx's little word bubble now. The problem is that in their social activity it itself, in what they are doing, individuals are acting as if money in its material reality is the embodiment of wealth as such. 
again, we reaffirm the symbolic order by acting in it. To engage in monetary exchanges to uphold the symbolic system and along with it, the big other. Thus, Marx said in his famous definition of ideology, they do not know it, but they are doing it. And that's another definition of ideology. You can kind of see how the one I gave you from Horkheimer is derived from it similarly. But they're all, it's all very self-referential. And so, but again, you can't break the system. If you rebel against the system within the system's framework, you're just affirming the system. And it grows ever harder to fully step out of the system without rejecting capitalism entirely. But really, funnily enough, Marxism isn't the rejection of capitalism. It is the logical conclusion of capitalism, according to Marx himself. Communism is simply the final stage of the dialectical material process in which we contain full control over the means of production and full control over markets and everything is, you know, ideally it's a stateless society and all that. So really, this idea that Zizek has of stepping out of the system, the symbolic order, isn't so much stepping out of the symbolic order as much as completing it according to Marx. Or if you were to build off of what Marx says, of course, Zizek is also building off a more Hegelian and a more uh, psychoanalytic base, which sort of changes things up a bit. Uh, Freud and the superego. The big other is the law underlying the symbolic order. So Zizek's word bubble here. Firstly, the big other is the law that communication and exchange has to proceed through the symbolic order. And secondly, the big other is the law that this attachment can never be fully brought into the consciousness of the individual subject. So again, this is like the meta rules. There's the rules governing the game, and then there's the meta rules. So the rules governing the game are that the horse can only go up three spaces and then one to the right or left. And the rules are that the bishops can only move on the diagonals. But the meta rules are you're not supposed to put your king in check. You can, you can willfully put, or checkmate, I should say, you can put your king willfully in checkmate, but the idea is not to do that. So the idea is not to play to lose. And that's the meta rule. The, the meta rule, the understated rule is to win or to get your the king in check, as is the understated rule of any game, essentially. You know, it doesn't need to be stated that the goal is to win for yourself. It can be, but that doesn't make it, again, it's not being fully brought forth. So everything has to proceed from the rule, everything has to proceed from this conception of the rules and the meta rules. And even as we try to point that out, there's no point in it as we're still going to end up by playing by. It. There's no really escape from it. Uh, the book continues. Zizek derives these ideas about the formation of the subject's identity through the big other's presence in the symbolic order from his reading of Lacan and Marx. Additionally, Zizek also holds the psychoanalytic ideas of Sigmund Freud that the big other is a repressive force of moral authority affecting the subject's psyche. And that's true to some extent. Um, that the idea of the superego is it's supposed to be the moral authority that controls the id and the, uh, well, not controls the id, but balances the id so that we're able to go out and present ourselves properly in society. And of course, in the context in which Zizek is speaking, it's repressive, so therefore it's bad. But, you know, that's not necessarily the case. It's obviously something should be pre uh, repressed. Zizek actually goes on to make that point himself in a later section, but I'm not sure if we'll be covering it or not. Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, but to continue, and hello, Chapin. Thanks for, uh, I hope it was a good one. I'm probably going to call in for the 300th episode uh, of America First. I, I've never actually tried to call in before, but should be fun. Anyway, the book continues. Freud calls the big other the superego, an ever-present figure of internal authority residing within each individual. The superego functions not only as a custodian of the symbolic order regarding meaning at the level of what can and cannot be said, but also it acts as a guardian of society's laws, morals, and codes of good behavior and proper conduct. Um, 
Oh crap! Was it three hundred three hundredth episode? Was it Colin? Damn! All right, I'll call on Friday. I I, I hope I hope he won't. Uh, what should we call it? Not to call in Fridays because it wasn't the three hundredth. But uh, this is Freud's little word bubble now. As an internalization of the father figure and cultural regulations, the superego controls our sense of right and wrong and guilt. And of course, this is popular among psycho analysts that there are these three parts. And, you know, there are parts of the brain identified within psychology today that control what we would consider abstract thought and morality and things like that. But at the same time, the. I, I'm trying to disagree with it, but I don't think I meant to. <laughs> um, you know, we have a moral compass, essentially, is what's the saying. The difference here is that Zizek's connotation, at least in this part, seems to be that it's bad, that these things shouldn't be repressed, whereas he goes on to kind of say that they should be. Maybe we'll get into that. The next heading on page 72 is doing the right thing. Zizek's insight into Freud's theory of the superego is that in obeying or transgressing society's laws and moral rules, the superego always remains extant. And so long and so long as the superego exists, so too does the subject. Zizek's polemical claim is that it is the law itself that generates the desire for its own violation. So simply by setting the rules we wish to violate in them. By having this figure other there, by this by having the big other there, our identity as subjects is able to be formed in opposition to it. And so what we end up having is instead. Am I still going? Okay, yeah, it doesn't look like it's paused or anything. Okay, sorry about that. Essentially, we need the big other or this nothingness to define ourselves while simultaneously being this nothingness. Because again, the superego is us. We are the unknown unknown, essentially. But of course, that doesn't really mean much unless you're an idealist who's saying we're being pushed by our inner unknown to be one with the absolute. But as a materialist like Zizek is and like Marxists are, it's a rather odd sentence. And so Zizek in his little word bubble says, our obedience to the law itself is not natural, spontaneous, but mediated by the repression of the desire of transgre to transgress the law. When we obey the law, we do it as part of a desperate strategy to fight against our desire to transgress it. So the more rig rigorously we obey the law, the more we bear witness to the fact that deep in ourselves, we feel the pressure of desire to indulge in sin. Which, yes and no. Again, this is sort of a, you can, you can kind of read this as a metaphysical claim where if there weren't this paternal figure hanging over us, we wouldn't have right and wrong to worry about to some extent. And by extension, there wouldn't be a right and wrong at all. But again, that's an unsubstantiated met metaphysical claim, you know. Uh, a lot of materialist, materialists, normally not of the Marxist variety, but of the uh, new atheist variety, like to act as if their materialist worldview, their materialist naturalist worldview is the null hypothesis, which doesn't have to be proven, but which must be acted against, which certainly isn't the case. The claim that all we have around us is material is a positive claim that must be proven itself. It is not the null hypothesis. I'm continuing with uh, Zizek's word bubbles. The superego's feeling of guilt is therefore right. The more we obey the law, the more we are guilty, because this obedience effectively is a defense against our sinful na nature. And in Christianity, the desire uh, or intention to sin equals the act itself. If you just covet your neighbor's wife, you already commit adultery. And that's okay. So that's wrong on a couple fronts. And this is a bigger disagreement. Yes, there is such a thing as quote unquote uh, thought crime within at least the Catholic Church and that you're not supposed to lust after people. You're not supposed to covet good. You're not supposed to jealously want things. Now, of course, you can want things sort of instinctually and you can sort of, you know, look upon someone lustfully, unconsciously. That itself is not a sin. That's just, you know, 
lizard brain going into overdrive right there. There's nothing sinful about that. It's when you start to do it consciously with the intent to do it, with the intent to covet your neighbor's goods or with the intent to lust after his nature's wife. So that's the real issue. Not simply the thought itself, but the fact the thought is done with intent. That is where the nature of the sin emerges. And at the same time, the thought is still not as bad as the action. And so Zizek is wrong here in saying that, you know, the um, uh, act of coveting thy neighbor's wife is the same as adultery. It's not. They're two very different things. Adultery is a much worse sin than simply lust. Uh, and to continue with his little, uh, this is a quote, no longer a word bubble, but the Christian superego attitude is perhaps best rendered by T.S. Eliot's line from his verse drama, Murder in the Cathedral. And so now this is a quote from Murder in the Cathedral, a good book. The highest form of treason to do the right thing for the wrong reason. Uh, Zizek again, even when you do the right thing, you do it in order to counteract and thus conceal the basic vileness of your true nature. But at the same thing, when you do that, it's rewarded in Christianity. Like, you know, we as fallen creatures, we are incomplete and we are prone to sin. Even Nietzsche identified this in Genealogy of Morality, which is that we as humans slump to the lowest common moral denominator all the time. And so to resist that is to, it is to acknowledge our sinful nature and to repress it. But of course, that's not bad. It uh, genuinely is not bad. It's, you know, it's good to achieve something higher. But of course, if you're a materialist, you don't necessarily believe in something higher. And so it's hard to make the case why repression of any kind is a good thing. Uh, but to continue, inbuilt transgression. For Zizek, transgression imagined or real forms of enjoyment that seem to contradict the dominant ideas or laws controlling social, moral, and ethical behavior is built into all societies. This is because for every law or ideal of behavior and conduct that exists in society, there is its implied crime or transgression that is prohibited or frowned upon, uh, Zizek's word bubble. Therefore, no political regime, whether totalitarian or liberal, can ever succeed solely by being repressive. Uh, to continue, and indeed, in all political regimes and societies, there is the tacit understanding that subjects can let off steam and enjoy activities that are not acknowledged in public life, such as telling dirty jokes, indulging in alcohol or drugs, consuming porn, watching violent sports, visiting prostitutes, and going to war. And of course, you know, that's true. That's the idea of Christ's ultimate forgiveness, that we do fall. We do stray from the straight and narrow. And so we are to be forgiven for it because we're inclined to do so. And as such, Christ offers us eternal forgiveness. But if you're a materialist atheist, you don't get that. And so it's hard to make the case why we shouldn't transgress, more importantly, or why the or why uh, repression is bad, unless you make a pragmatic case of your own, which is something, of course, again, the critical theorists like Zizek studied under have a problem with. And this is the last little section for this part anyway, the night of the world. Zizek's thesis, therefore, is that the superego itself is an obscene agency active within every subject. Zizek believes that this idea was already recognized by Hegel and his dark vision of humankind known as the night of world, outlined in Real Philosophie Manuscript of 1805 to 1806. Uh, Hegel, the human being is this night, this empty nothing that contains everything, an unending wealth of many representations, images, of which none belongs to him, to which none are present. One catches sight of this night when one looks a human being in the eye into a night that becomes awful. So that's the end of Hegel's quote. And that's sort of where I'll leave it off for that section. Uh, there's another section I want to get to in just a bit. But again, he gets into the idea of nothingness as presented by Hegel. But that idea of nothingness isn't really fully Hegelian. Instead, what it is is sort of selling Hegel short, because that idea that we are nothing miss but this collection of imagery and movements and essentially just a big performative dance is behind it the idea that the nothingness isn't really nothingness, it is the absolute, it is everything. So it is being nothingness uh, reconciled into one, pushing us to be unified with it. And so 
it's a very idealist point, but when used by a materialist, makes the case for a kind of fatalism against repression, to put it in a certain way. And so there's, of course, this, again, throughout the whole thing, there was this implied idea that repression is bad. We should indulge the superego as or the representative of the symbolic order doesn't exist and therefore isn't justified. It's unnatural. We should engage in natural inclinations as such without fear of the symbolic order. But at the same time, in what I'm about to read, which is uh, what I get into a little bit more, uh, he kind of makes the point against that. So that last bit was on page 75. And so I'm picking up now on page 97, heading The Death of God. In Western society, today it may seem difficult to identify the presence of a dominating superego, especially since society has moved away from Christian forms of morality and towards secularism. And this is a uh, Nietzsche has a little word bubble now. I declared the at the end of the 19th century that God is dead. This, this, this is how it's typed in the book. I don't know if this is a typo on my end, but um, um, before I continue, uh, uh, Isaac, then, are you an idealist? If not, what? Are, no, I'm not an idealist. I am. The metaphysic I endorse is hylomorphism which is a kind of dualism, but not exactly. It's more, <laughs> it's like dualism if it went through Hegelian synthesis, to put it in an interesting way. I would make the case that um, the hylomorphism of Thomas Aquinas is actually the first act of the uh, dialectic that Hegel just simply wouldn't, wasn't aware of because he wasn't a Catholic. But it is sort of this idea that there is form and there is matter. Form can exist without matter, but matter cannot exist without form because it is always taking the form of something. There can be no primordial matter that is formless. It is always something. And so, but in order to be realized in some instances, form just as much needs matter. And so you have the synthesis of being, which is not a holy form or the ideal, but not wholly simply material. It is the necessity of both that feed into each other. And so that, that is my metaphysic. But I am reading um, Edward's, Edward Fesser's, uh, what's the title of the book? I got it here in my backpack too, uh, Aquinas Beginner's Guide. So as I get more into that, perhaps I'll, um, I, mean, I in my Discord group, I'm actually reading it with people like Mathoma and Fiery Elmo and uh, Old Valet. So... If, if you're interested in reading about Aquinas, by all means, join the Discord and hop in. I'll let you know what we're up to. Uh, but to continue. This put paid to the idea. Okay, I think I'm starting to get this because I, I read this the first time and I didn't know quite what it meant. But this put paid to the idea of a higher superior power symbolized by the figure of God controlling mankind's individual and social behavior through an entire set of moral prohibitions and taboos as the, the basis for which are the Ten Commandments. That doesn't sound grammatically right to me as I'm reading it still, but I get the idea. It's that... I think I get the idea. I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, but, you know, again, killing God kills the moral basis, things like that. Uh, continuing, following the idea of the death of God and the apparent loosening of moral injunctions within Western society, the Russian author Fyodor Dostoevsky is, according to the existential philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, supposed to have declared, if there is no God, then everything is permitted. Zizek believes that this freedom to do as we wish never in reality overthrows the omnipresent figure of the superego. Even in states of apparent lawlessness, such as that during the Bosnian crisis of the 1990s, the super the superego exerted a paradoxical power. Rather than forbidding permissiveness, the superego retained its authority by granting it. If you follow me, uh, quote, if you fo and this is the superego talking, I suppose. If you follow me, you may with impunity rape, sexually harass, kill. 
And so on page 99, you have the myth of permissive society. In the West, the idea of the permissive society emerged after the radical events and riots in European capitals in 1968, led by a mix of anarchists, communists, and proto-hippies. I don't know if proto is appropriate. I think they'd be hippies at that point. We aim to question, uh, this is the hippies talking in their little word bubble now, which is a cool, if you can go to the Amazon version and flip to page 99, if it's not plotted out, it's a pretty funny image. Um, we aim to question capitalism along with the ideas of morality as transmitted by the notion of the nuclear family with its emphasis upon social stability and sexual restriction. I don't know why I read that like a hillbilly, but, <laughs> but in fact, but what, in fact, happened after 1968 was that its revolutionary, uh, revolutionary ideas of liberation were reappropriated by postmodern capitalism and flawlessly incorporated into its own ideology of apparent liberalism that pretends to be no longer strict and authoritarian. And this is something else Zizek talks about a lot, which I agree with, is that liberal capitalism co-ops any ideology. And I think it's true, just as true of you know, left as it is of right. For if you look at any, you know, truly reactionary attempt at reestablishing tradition, it's always co-opted by consumerism, people looking to make a buck. Um, really, any political movement is sort of like that. I mean, you can look at uh, the failure that is Gamergate and the failure that is the alt-right and the failure that is Kekistan and things like that, all destroyed by grifters looking to come in and make a quick buck off of the profit system. And, you know, there you go. The alt-right is now a capitalist uh, shell corporation, essentially. But uh, to continue, Zizek believes that the idea of a permissive society in the West is largely a myth. It may be true that ever new forms of perversity are indulged in, but this does not mean that society is hedonistic and free of moral injunctions. Whereas Dostoevsky declared, if there is no God, everything is permitted, Zizek subscribes to Lacan's riposte to Dostoevsky, if there is no God, nothing is permitted. And of course, this speaks to the fact that even though we supposedly live in a very sexually open society, we are constantly being uh, nagged by busybodies about consent, about what is and isn't appropriate to do in social situations. The fact that without God, we in fact have even more moral busy busybodies to worry about than we did when we did have God. And so the superego is now reformulating uh, itself such that you must do everything as opposed to you can't do some things. Zizek's central thesis is that in a situation where everything is permitted, what in fact happens is an increase rather than a decrease in self-regulation. And, you know, that's true. Again, see campuses. You have these unspoken uh, rules that you're expected to follow, which eventually become codified, but they destroy unspoken social convention. And so everything you normally wanted to do in order to try to communicate kind of goes out the window. And so there's no real communication anymore. It just becomes sort of uh, weird gestures and talking points because you can't tell a joke. You can't like come in physical contact with someone without being accused of rape, all these sorts of things. And so again, a point of agreement that Zizek and those on the right would have. And now to continue. Um, Zizek acknowledges the superego dominating Western society today is not what it was during the era of modernity from the late 19th century until the period immediately following the Second World War. In modernity, the individual was governed by the injunction to be a good citizen and ultimately, if necessary, to sacrifice one's life to the cause of the nation. And he's got like these caricatures of like a Soviet miner and like an American businessman. And the American businessman says in the West, the imperative was be a good Democrat. While in alternative, while alternatively it, in the Eastern Bloc, it was be a good communist. In other words, the superego during this time was that of a paternal authority. And so now Zizek gets into, uh, this is something else he talks about. Of course, if you're going to talk about Freud, he can't not talk about an Oedipal complex. And so we get into paternal authority figures. The figure of paternal authority dominating mankind in the era of modernity corresponds to Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic idea of the Oedipal father 
ensuring that the subject acts in socially acceptable and meaningful ways. See, uh, and we'll get into that. And Zizek's word bubble. But under late capitalism, society no longer models itself upon a traditional paternal authority or superego. Instead, a new form of superego has emerged. Referring to Freud's ideas, Zizek believes that this is reflected in a shift from a figure of an Oedipal father representing authority to a primal father of obscene enjoyment who symbolizes authority in postmodernism. In his book, Totem et Taboo, Totem and Taboo, Resemblances Between the Mental Lives of Savages and Neurotics, Freud postulates that within the prehistorical stage of human development, and therefore extent within today's social and collective unconscious, there existed a fundamentally different type of paternal authority from the Oedipal father. And at this time, the family or tribe unit, which Freud referred to as the primal horde, was controlled by a father figure who retained exclusive rights over all the females and drove away or even killed his sons who challenged his authority. And you've got like a pretty wicked caveman with like some chicks around him and his head's on a head and he's wielding a club and this is his word bubble. In these circumstances, no societal law of prohibition existed, rather the primal father ruled by pure force. And of course, he's wielded his pure force by killing somebody else and securing all the uh, females within the area. How did, how did the Oedipal father come to take the place of the primal father in Freud's view? And this is Freud's word bubble. Jealous of the primal father and his exclusive rights of enjoyment, the sons decided to kill their father and, being cannibals, eat him. I don't know if they were cannibals at the time, but uh, he is dead on the next page and there's two dudes chomping down on him. Uh, continuing, however, following this act of parricide, the sons were overwhelmed by their newfound liberty and decided to restore the figure of a paternal authority to the social order in the form of the Oedipal father who prohibits the primal crimes of incest and murder. This figure is named after the mythical Oedipus who killed his father and married his mother. And so you see here Zizek kind of doing a bit of a 180 on what we talked about earlier, being that now what's up is to reestablish this father figure so you don't have this intensely permissive society in which nothing is allowed. Now, the counterbalance to this would be that Zizek prefers the Oedipal, primal, uh, Oedipal father figure to the primal father figure in that you can rebel against the primal father figure without this, uh, you know, well, actually, we'll get into it in a little bit, but you can rebel against the, uh, not the primal father figure, the Oedipal father figure uh, justly, and so build your own identity off of it properly, like the super ego or the big other, you can actually bounce off of it. Now, uh, oops, excuse me for a second. Okay, we back. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but it's easier, as I was saying, um, it's not easier to rebel, uh, rebel against the primal father. It's easier to rebel against the Oedipal father because he's a classical authority figure of the superego. In the same way, it's easier to rebel against the superego and be permissive when he's telling you not to do things as opposed to when he's telling you to do everything. Because when he's telling you to do everything, you know, to abstain is not only going against social norms, but it's also hard because, you know, your human instinct wants you to indulge in sinful activity. So it's doubly hard to rebel against the primal father as opposed to the Oedipal father. Zizek believes that today the figure of the Oedipal paternal authority is no longer operative within society and that an obscene primal father rules in his place, exhorting everyone to emulate him in a joy. Uh, Zizek word bubble. Today, the commandment of the ruling ideologies is enjoy, sexual enjoyment, consumption, commodity enjoyment, up to spiritual enjoyment or realizing yourself. Zizek formulates this as the injunction, enjoy slash superego is enjoy. Rather than forbidding the subject to indulge in immoral or excessive and perverse pleasures, which was previously the role performed by the Oedipal father in the guise of the superego, 
Zizek observes that now there exists a pressure to fulfill, to fulfill such desires, as if this is the only way happiness can be found, which is, again, a fairly reactionary point that I think most people would agree, and everybody is expected to indulge in degeneracy in order to be happy, but rea in reality, happiness is found through tradition. And so, uh, Zizek's word bubbles on the next page, paradoxically, enjoyment itself is in its innermost status something imposed, ordered. When we enjoy, we always follow a certain injunction. And so this is the idea that when you're forced to enjoy, not only is it not enjoyment, but to rebel is to not enjoy, and as such, make yourself more miserable. But it's more of a sack. So rebelling against the primal father figure is just infinitely harder than rebelling against the Oedipal father figure the ever-present object of desire. Today's commodity culture finds its perfect complement in a superego dedicated to enjoyment. Two principal ideologies are responsible for this. And you got the little hippie caricature saying, the 1960s counterculture in which freedom was equated with personal, moral, and sexual liberation. And then I think uh, a picture of Justin Timberlake, which is saying, and the emulation in society today of youth and youth culture around which much advertising and media attention revolves. In light of this, Zizek suggests that desire no longer revolves around an unattainable forbidden and therefore a effectively absent object of desire guarded by a prohibitive superego. Today's superego, with its demand upon us to enjoy forces and to enjoy forces desire and its objects to of gratification to short circuit into an impulsive spiral of addiction. Since subject Activity is equated with the fulfillment of desire it is as if the absent object of desire has now become ever present. And so with enjoyment everywhere to rebel against the superego is to now to not enjoy anything or to not enjoy what you're in to what you're told to enjoy. Inevitably, today's injunction to enjoy has its fallout, resulting in a pressure to look good, to look healthy, to be young, and for women to be slim, and so on. The imperative is that you should be consuming, shopping, eating, having sex, etc. The logic of the injunction is that if you are not doing these things, then you are an unfortunate individual. The pressure to do more, see more, enjoy more actually makes people deeply unhappy. And this is true. This is psychologically provable. And you know, you can look at evidence of like the more sexual partners someone has, the more likely they are to be unhappy. And there's a direct uh, corollary link as well there because it has to do with the releasing of pleasure hormones within the brain. And the fact that the more you experience them, the more you become no, uh, dull to the, your effect. Of course, this is like drug use and anything else where if you use a drug so often, you build up a tolerance to it. And so you need an ever larger hit in order to get your fill. But the same thing can be said about activities such as sex or TV or eating or anything like that, anything that has the same chemical response in the brain. And so eventually we just end up hating enjoyment itself and we end up going into withdrawal without it. But of course, that's what, to transgress the superego in this era, that's what we would have to do. The enjoyment dictated by today's superego is therefore actually an obscene enjoyment, because it is not enjoyment at all that is that the superego decrees, but an imaginary stimulated idea of enjoyment. And here we get into like the uh, father figures again. As a way of con contrasting how the edible and primal superegos function within the psyche, Zizek is fond of telling a tale of two fathers asking their child to visit their grandmother on a Sunday afternoon. And I've if you listen to a lot of his lectures, this is definitely uh, one of his big references, the examples of the fathers. He's spoken about it at least in three lectures that I can think of off the top of my head. And so, imagine a good old-fashioned Oedipal father. He says to his child, I don't care how you feel, but you must visit your grandmother. You have to go, you are going, and behave properly. But let's imagine a so-called tolerant postmodern father. He says to his child, you know how much your grandmother loves you, but nonetheless, you should visit her only if you really want to. In the first case, the stakes of the imperative are very clear and explicit. The Oedipal father can either be obeyed or resisted. But in the second case, this apparent free choice secretly contains an even stronger order. Not only should you visit your grandmother, but you have to like it. This is an example of how um, 
this is an example of how a parent tolerant free choice conceals within it a stronger order and a stronger uh, moral imperative of what must be considered good. And so this is what I was talking about earlier, that Zizek, while earlier on, rags against the idea of the superego and repression, at the same time prefers the, Oedi the Oedipal father's superego ego to the postmodern father's superego so that it is easier to rebel. Because ultimately, what Zizek seeks is, from what I can tell, excuse me, uh, the ultimate abolition of the superego itself, the ultimate abolition of any repression whatsoever, rather than being forced to enjoy or being forced not to enjoy, rather simply not having any moral imperative to do one or the other. Um, at least that's what I can glean from so far. And honestly, that's a take I think his, is endorsed in some of his lectures, that to abstain is bad, that Christian or Catholic uh, ascetism or, you know, the life of living without many luxuries at all is something to be rejected because even, you know, it's an ideal you can't live up to. It's something not worth trying. And at the end, it's unnatural, according to him. Needless to say, of course, some making something natural, it does, of course, not make it good. There has to be a reason natural is good. And of course, people who are Thomists uh, sometimes get this called, uh, uh, have the same thing thrown in their face and that, well, you say the natural order is good. Why is it good? And of course, the answer is because it's ordained by God, not simply that it is natural, but that it is an order ordained by a greater force and a greater moral imperative than simply being natural. But of course, again, Zizek, a materialist, wouldn't make that case and can't make that case because it's just not what he metaphysically believes in. And it's so his subject oriented ontological center makes nothingness the center. And what this nothingness does is essentially tries to force us to somehow the, you know, the super ego is the other and the big other is essentially nothingness, which is essentially us. But at the same time, it's still trying to force us to move society in a certain direction. It's still forcing us to obey certain moral commands and things like that. But, uh, of course, it's also nothingness at the same time, which is a massive contradiction in uh, Thomistic uh, philosophy and things like that. But besides that, it's really an attempt to escape the idealism of Hegel in some sense, or tacitly endorse it. Uh, with Zizek, it's kind of hard to tell because it can go either way. It can go, oh, uh, you know, is, is Zizek tacitly endorsing, you know, reactionary idealism in the vein of Hegel and Spangler and things like this? Or is he really a materialist who doesn't realize that his system is incoherent? Uh, hard to tell. He probably wouldn't frame it as a materialist whose system is incoherent, of course, but needless to say, this idea of the nothingness being the center which drives us forward, you know, it's interesting because at the same time as it's nothingness, it's driving us forward and it's also our center. So this idea that this thing, this superego that is nothing is driving us forward is also at our center. So really, it's we who are driving ourselves forward in the form of the superego that we all agree exists. So it's society collectively pushing itself forward, which I suppose, putting it like that, you could interpret through the lens of a materialist dialectic and so forth, but not easily. There would There needs to be finagling, as there does with all of Marx's system, because you took Hegel, who was an idealist, and you flipped the system he used to justify absolute idealism on its head by claiming it justifies this sort of vague materialist method, which is something else um, of note. Because if you read, I'm reading Critical Theory of Selective Essays by Max Horkheimer as well. And if you read what he has to say about materialism and idealism, it's more so that materialism and idealism are just methods 
and and that they're used to obtain knowledge within a certain historical and material context that the rest of society has sort of agreed upon and move forward from there. But in that sense, there really is no metaphysic to Marxism. There is nothing grounding it other than the normative whims of those within society and those who happen to control the means of production, which would sort of destroy the Marxic, Marxist case in some extent, to some extent, that there needs to be this necessary push forward because there doesn't have to be. It all depends on what people say it should be because it is a series of normative claims made on their part. I, I, I highlight whole sections. Well, I don't highlight. I underline with pens and I write commentary a little bit in the margins of the book, of course. But there's large sections that I would simply refer to in Max Horkheimer's work as a normative gop is sort of what I'd call it. Because it's a series of arguments that Horkheimer lays out and then a normative claim, which he thinks follows from his arguments. But really, it doesn't. Because again, as he's arguing against this sort of vague materialist positivist liberal pragmatic outlook he's at the same time undermining his own arguments because if everything is just contextual then his own arguments are just contextual and are to be taken no more at face value than liberal pragmatism and so especially if it is especially if his ideology were to become dominant which one may argue it has that was something i tried to get wrap my head around very like these I did a stream not too long ago. Well, actually, it probably was a long time ago. I'd have to look at it. Um, but I did a stream some time ago involving uh, a, p a paper written specifically about, uh, yeah, uh, it, <laughs> it's one year ago. It's striking at the foundations of critical review. And it was a paper specifically dedicated to expounding upon critical theory and things like that. And essentially what I uh, pointed out in that stream was this whole thing assumes uh, an inherent position of inferiority, as if it were uh, perpetually going to be the subservient ideology of the times. And so if it were to become dominant, it would essentially be rendered null and void because you need to engage in a criticism of it as well. Now. I think that's personally what's happening right now is you have seen a sort of postmodern neo-Marxism, <laughs> to steal a phrase from Jordan Peterson, come out. And people think that's an incoherent phrase. Um, it's most certainly not uh, because some, you know, speaking of building, you know, contextual relations, people like uh, Deleuze and Derrida would build those same things. And Deleuze and, are, and Derrida are people who... Um, uh, Zizek references himself quite a bit. And if you read the uh, critical theory selected essays by Horkheimer, if you read really anything by the Frankfurt School and those who founded critical theory, and you read it with and uh, compare it with postmodernists, there's clearly a lot of overlap. It's clearly coming from the same vein of thought, which is all uh, bastardized Hegelian dialectics, essentially. And so all you're getting from this is that things are contextual, built upon webs of webs with nothing truly in the center. Uh, there is no one frame of reference for which to judge things. And so nothing is essentially supreme and nothing is really absolute. And so, you know, moral relativism sort of naturally follows from this. It's not, you know, People like Jordan Peterson might oversimplify it, but I think they do it for the point of, you know, explaining it to the audience. But, you know, read Deleuze, read Derrida, read Foucault, read, um, uh, read Heidegger even. Um, Marcusa, uh, Herbert Marcusa, another big founding father of critical theory, wrote a whole book called Heideggerian Marxism. And of course, Heidegger was one of the founding fathers, sort of, of postmodernist thought. And so there is clearly a neo-Marxist, because the critical theory folks are neo-Marxist postmodern overlap. And that being the case, they're constantly kind of just undermining their own cases, right? Because, well, for one, if everything is contextual, so is their own opinion. So is postmodernism as the late uh, log as the logic of late capitalism. Everything is contextual, and so it's not going to be permanent. And so 
we can immediately dismiss it once we've deemed ourselves past it in terms of, you know, how we view, uh, you know, the stages of history to have progressed. And so we shouldn't necessarily take anything seriously. There's no imperative to take the contextual material standards of our day at face value. There's no reason to take them seriously. And so they undermine their own case for normative claims, which is why I call a lot of what I see in Max Horkheimer's book, Normative Gop. There is no substantial basis on which they can build these claims other than the idea that they, um, you know, other than that, you know, they're returning to some sort of absurd primitivism of a kind in which only what's natural is what is to be done. But again, that's a claim that needs backing up. In fact, there's another such claim. Yeah. Uh, there's a, uh, here, let to illustrate this point, another quote from Horkheimer in his essay, Materialism and Metaphysics. Because the satisfaction of desire, unlike higher motives, requires no reasons, excuses, or justifications. Justification may indeed be quite appropriate in a particular society for particular actions, but only a particular authority and not because of some unconditional order of things. So uh, the whole the whole first sentence, because I realized I could have half of it, is materialism refuses, however, to distinguish between happiness and pleasure because the satisfaction of desire, unlike higher motives, requires no reasons, excuses, or justifications. And the simple question is why? Like, you know, people don't understand the power of why. Like, why does it require no justifications just because it's natural? Well, why does something natural require no justifications? Like it's a series of question begging normative responses. And so uh, you end up, it doesn't end up building anything substantial. It just ends up claiming that we are all nothing to nothingness. We shall return, live life uh, in, you know, like a heathen, essentially. I might... Uh, I don't know for anyone's listening, whether you just joined or have been listening for some time, but I might do a little review stream of the two essays I've read of Horkheimer's uh, so far. Those being uh, Notes on Science and the Crisis and Materialism and Metaphysics. Not the whole thing, because they're incredibly long and incredibly dense, and reading critical theory is a pain. I'm going to actually stop, but... Yeah, I don't know. Anybody in the chat have any opinions on that? Anybody want to hear a review of the uh, Frankfurt School by someone who's not just LARPing uh, as some sort of anti-ideology ideologue? I don't know. It's been a uh, it's been a while since I've done just a flat out paper review, but uh, yeah. Anyway, that was uh, my thoughts on. Not only Zizek, but a lot of his really, it's really my thoughts on Zizek's philosophy, essentially. You know, again, a subjective moral center makes no more sense than no moral center. And as such, there cannot be no morality built on it. The self as the other, as nothingness, is not only metaphysically unjustifiable, but is also impossible to... Uh, whatchamacallit, build a morality on top of it's impossible to build a conception on which doesn't fall into fatalism and things like that. And essentially, the the main building blocks from which Zizek takes, those being a kind of psychoanalysis and a sort of, uh, whatchamacallit, a bastardized Hegelian Marxism, a bastardized left Hegelianism, we'll say, are inevitably just tearing themselves down along with any other cogent right-wing philosophy. You know, in, in throwing out the baby, they're also throwing out the bathwater, which is exactly, funnily enough, what Kurt Doolittle does just from the exact, actually, in probably the exact same way. Um, but you can't argue metaphysics with Kurt Doolittle. And so avant-garde student and Isaac then uh, do it. I think it'd be a good way for me to understand their ideas. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'd be happy to review selected essays on critical theory. Um, I have to temper myself, though, because reading this stuff is genuinely a mental drain. Like, um, some books really are just better off burnt. There's no simple, there's no easy way to put it. 
but I'd be happy to review the uh, first two essays at least, or at least selected bits. Because like I've said, I've gone through it and I've underlined certain parts that I thought are of a particular value and a particular use. And it's worth noting, I don't necessarily disagree with all of Horkheimer's conclusions in the same vein that I don't disagree with all of Zizek's in that, you know, Zizek saying the Oedipal father is preferable to the uh, primal father, essentially endorsing a form of tradition as opposed to a form of uh, postmodern indulgence and things like that. So different methodologies, same kind of conclusions. And in the same way, Horkheimer uh, comes to similar conclusions about uh, not letting the context getting the better of us and being trying to be beyond it and trying to acknowledging acknowledging where it exists and where it influences us uh, influences us and things like that but uh yeah good times good times well so you know what this has been going on for a while now so i'll shut her down oh oy vey, shut it down <laughs> um but yeah thanks everybody for joining in i hope some of you got something out of this and yeah Peace out and have a